Okay, what we're going to do here is create a very simple shader which will turn the enemy here uh, black and white basically and it's going to flash a couple of times. Uh, the point being is we want to duplicate uh, Final Fantasy VI's little enemy flash. Uh, so here I have uh, Get Dave's video here on Let's Play. Uh, we're going to show how that looks first. So here if I advance frame by frame, you'll see it changes to this, and then it just flashes one more time. So what we're seeing here, first we need to know what we're gonna try to do. Uh, there's a shadow down here, and other than that, it's mostly like these outline areas or crevices um, that are just black or close to black. And you'll see what uh, seems to happen here is those areas change to white. All the basically black changes to white, and everything else changes to black. So that's very good and simple. Um, we're going to do that in Godot with a Godot shader. So first we're going to add the shader. Uh, you can create it anywhere, but create a resource, shader. I'm just going to call it attack flash. And on your sprite, um, if you're not already there, go down to the material and expand it like this. And then you'll see this shader uh, spot down here. Uh, you just drag that in or select it however you like. And if you double click the file itself, you'll have this editor come up for uh, the shader. So the fragment is what we're going to be using. Vertex is for moving vertices typically. Fragment uh, is basically pixels except it's got more information than just color. But we're only going to be working with the color today. So with shaders, uh, Godot has a bunch of built-in variables that you don't have to define. One of them is color. That's just literally the RGB, red, green, and blue, and the alpha, which is the transparency. So it's a vector four. Like those four values make up the color at each, uh, each location in this image. We're not going to mess with the transparency because we only want to change the color of the sprite itself. And if we mess with transparency, uh, even by accident, you'll start affecting the uh, areas over here surrounding it. So for these purposes, I'm going to say pixel instead of fragment, and that'll just make it easier for us to wrap our heads around if familiar with sprites. So that said, this code here runs for every pixel. Uh, so at a given pixel, you can think of this uh, color RGB is just the red, green, and blue value for that pixel, and think of it as iterating over all of them. So what we need to do as it's running is determine is it black or not. So the way we're going to do that is with this length function. So what the hell does that mean? So we're going to use this handy little online vector visualizer to help understand that. So the red, green, and blue color values when we're talking about shaders go from 0 to 1, not 0 to 255. So when we say the length of the RGB, which is all three of them, of course, we're kind of the resultant. Like if you were to add all these vectors together, it would be the length in the end. So there's definitely some nuance in there when you get into mixing colors, but since we're only looking for black, which is not a mixture, we can basically say that if the resultant vector is very small, it's going to be black or close to it. So like this would be white if, if all three were one in this case. So if we were to change that, if I made every one point one instead of one, the resultant vector would be very short and that would more equate to black. And that's what we're gonna be looking for because these are the colors we're gonna to wanna to change. So this color variable, we can read from it and then write to it, uh, which is useful, of course. So if I say if the length of that vector is less than a certain value, I'm gonna say 0 0.1. This has to be a float, by the way. Uh, that's basically saying the pixel we're on is black or at least close to black. So when that happens, we want to change it to white. Uh, just as we saw here, that's what happens to the black. So now that we've read from it, we're going to write to it, color RGB. So we need a vector 3, which is vec3 in the shader language, and then 1.0. Now, normally you'd put all three values, like your R, G, and B in here, but since they're all the same because we want to change those blacks to whites, uh, we can just put in the 1.0 and it will assume that's the value for all three. And you see up here, some of the black areas, we did get some white. Um, but looking here, it does not include the shadow and all the outline, which it seemed to do in the actual game. So all we need to do is move this threshold. And you could put this as a variable too, by the way, and pass that in. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to up that to 0.2. There we go. That's much closer to what the actual game does. It includes the shadow down here. So that's for all of the pixels that fall within that range. It's changing to white. So now um, let's take care of the rest of them because now we want all the rest of them to be black. Uh, just put else here. So for all the rest, change the color 
to black instead. So it's just going to be the very opposite. Just put zero. And this has to be a float, by the way. So you'll get an error if you um, do this. You can just put a decimal place, kind of like significant digits, and that'll take care of it. Uh, if you're more comfortable, add the zero. But that's all you really need to do, and the semicolon. And there we have it. So next thing we need to do is this needs to go on and off. If it's supposed to flash, but in that case, it needs to do something over time. So there's also the time variable, and this just is how many seconds or nanoseconds, whatever, how much time has passed since the engine started, and I think it'll loop to keep it from going infinite, but the point being we'll use that in order to have something go back and forth. So if you've seen any shaders before, you've probably seen this technique. It's very common. Uh, we're going to use the sine function and time. So what this is going to do is over time, the value is going to go above zero, then it's going to go below zero, between one and negative one and one, basically. If we just look up some simple images of sine waves, we can explain this visually. So here, like as the values increase from you know zero up to infinity, whatever it is, the sine of that is going to be positive, and then it's going to be negative, and then it's just going to repeat. 50% of the time it's going to be positive, 50% of the time it's going to be negative. And that's where we're going to get the flash from. So I want to store this in a variable. So be a float sine of the times. <laughs> and then we need to act on it depending on if it's positive or not. So we'll do a bool. If that value is greater than zero, like so, else. And same thing, make sure it's a float. Okay, so now we have whether or not the value is positive. So I'm just gonna put all of this inside a if block here. And just indent it so it looks clean. So now you see what's happening up here is it's flashing very, very slowly. So of course it's not happening fast enough. So all we have to do though is make the time progress faster. So go in here and we're gonna multiply this by 10, for example. So there you see it's moving faster, and I've already played with this. What I thought was pretty close to the original game was 50. I'm not going to put that in there until I can disable it so I don't give anyone epilepsy problems. But there's one last thing we need. We need to be able to activate this from code. I think you can probably swap out shaders in code and actually change the shader or take it off and put it back on. Uh, but for something this simple, I'm actually just going to trigger it with a variable. And what we need for that... By the way, if you do not see uh, shader type as canvas item, if it's 2D, that's got to be the case. Spatial is the other type. So we need a uniform variable. just means it's the same for all of the pixels that we're going across. Um, but that exposes it something that we can change and pass into the shader. So I'm just going to say uniform attack and defaults to false. Would help if I put bool. OK. And then same thing I did here. I'm just going to wrap all this in that if block and then just indent it so you don't go crazy. So now it's not happening anymore because I defaulted to the false. But if we go back to the uh, shader parameters here, when you put a uniform up here, uh, it will be exposed as shader parameters here. So if I check this on, that's what's going to trigger it. So we're going to trigger that in code. So now that I can shut it off, I'm going to go ahead and put the 50 in here, and then we can see the real rate just for a moment. There we go. So I want to mention that I am going to go over more of this enemy attack thing in, a, in the next tutorial or two, the actual enemy attack flow, which I haven't done in the rest of this playlist so far. But I wanted to do this first uh, just to get it out of the way, because if, you know, if someone wants to know how to do this, it's going to be buried in there. Uh, so we're treating that separately for now. So I will be coming back on how to handle the enemy timing, uh, but I've, I've got it set up just to not actually do anything, but just to go through the turns and, you know, interrupt the player turns. So this is the only part of the code right here that pertains to the uh, flash. Basically, I just got a variable here which gets the enemy object that it's, it's iterating over in this loop, and that's the node2d object, to be clear. It gets the sprite, and then within the sprite gets the material. So within the material, which is this, of course. Um, the shader parameters, if you hover over, you can see here shader parameter forward slash attack. And actually, I'm going to make that attack flash just to uh, match what I already did in the code before, because that's what I did before. And you'll see that that variable, the uniform up here, that determines uh, what that path is. So it's shader parameters plus whatever your uniform is after that forward slash. 
So here you can see that's why that's why I changed it is because I have attack flash here already. So we've got the material. You could do get if you wanted to get the value, by the way. Uh, but here we're just setting the parameter. You have to just put in that path as you can see by hovering in the editor. And I'm going to set it to true. That'll enable it. Now here is just a quick tween this callable from and then this anonymous method syntax here. That's good to run some code uh, on a delay. It fits in nicely with Godot's stuff. So what this is doing is just setting that variable to true. It's going to flash until this code runs, which sets it back to false. This set delay just delays this code from executing for 0.2 seconds, and this is a very quick thing. So that does the trick. And let me prove it. All right, and I added this enemy timer bar in here. There, there's the flash. I am going to come back to this. Like I said, we'll uh, get into the actual full enemy attack uh, in future tutorials, but this will just demonstrate uh, the shader being activated and deactivated. So there we go.